Hey, it's Natalie. We're glad to welcome you to our July 31st Friday Focus live from Chattanooga. We have lots of great service, projects, and Master Gardener outreach to discuss today. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Tom Stebbins to get it all kicked off. Yeah, we've got a lot to do today. And uh, the first 10 minutes is just going to be me explaining where Chattanooga is. Of course, there, most people know where Chattanooga you might not have known that there's, uh, I think we're bordering by six Tennessee counties and three Georgia counties. So we're right there. right at the, And we get a lot of great master gardeners from Georgia, from Catoosa, from Walker. I think we've had some from Dade. So we're really happy to, maybe about 10% of our, our, uh, our master gardeners are from Georgia, some of the most active. Of course, um, the Tennessee River goes right through the county. You can see there's four bridges in Chattanooga, four maybe five, but then the next one is way at the northern end of the county, 30 miles away. So you can see it takes a, it divides the county up. And that's one of the reasons why Master Garden, our county travels more for our hours than any other county. Um, the nicknames, of course, Scenic City is the official one, but people have called us Gig City, Nuga. And uh, we've won, we're kind of proud, Outside Magazine gave us the best town ever 2011-2015. And so um, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to start out at the county office. That's where Natalie is and myself. And then we're going to fly over to Signal Mountain and look at the McCoy Garden who won the award for the project. And we're going to go downtown to the aquarium garden and see um, Mike Payne right there, <clears throat> right outside the aquarium. And then we're going to go just a little ways away to the food bank garden where Katie Bishop is going to talk about one of our long-standing projects. Of course, we've got other projects around too. You can see we're spread out in Chattanooga and hopefully you can read underneath, uh, underneath the boxes, which I can't. You can see all our projects. Here's here. I think we've got probably more projects on the, on the, um, the hours hotline TEMG than anybody else and it, I don't know they just keep accumulating but you can see that we've we're in the into the zoo we're at markets we're we've got a big expo a couple of things that really nailed us this year we couldn't do our expo which is usually in April and we've canceled our county fair and so that's that's kind of disheartening so we're trying to pick it up uh, with other things here's where we're at we're we're not downtown we're we're about 10 miles away from downtown in a place called Bonnie Oaks Arboretum and Gardens. This used to be the site of an old uh, orphanage. And the orphanage was, um, there's a sign. And um, this is what the grounds look like. The master gardeners maintain the flower garden right there. They've been doing that for the last four or five years. <clears throat> and there's the Bonnie Oaks Oak. That's a landmark tree that was there probably when the when the children were there at the children's uh, school. That's our office. It's an older building. It's an, it used to be the old boys dormitory for the orphanage. And the fountain isn't working this year. So we decided not to kind of showcase that, but maybe later we will, but it's still the garden is being kept up during, during this pandemic. The, the people who were there in the time, some of them are in their eighties, they're still around and they put up the statue maybe five or six years ago. And they gather at the statue every on the last Saturday in April. And there you see, um, there's a little, well, there was a house called the Dent House. It was built around 1852. And that was where the orphanage school headmaster lived. And now it's Polly Claire's tea room. And we're gonna, we're gonna have a takeout from that after we get done here and enjoy their great food and atmosphere. If anybody comes to Chattanooga, that's a must see right there. Um, that big oak tree I talked about loses its limbs from time to time. I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't. I've got one limb aiming at my office, but one fell down uh, last year and one of our master gardeners said, well, let's turn that, uh, turn that into a lemonade, you know, instead of uh, just carting it off. So we made a nice little bench out of it that may last a few years. Um, I'm proud to say that um, back in the day, 1993, 1994 is when Master Gardeners started in Hamilton County. And Joe Nichols, well, it cost 24 hours, 24 hours of service, but Joe Nichols is still in an active Master Gardener. 
he came back, um, I think, th four or five years ago with his wife, Alberta, and they're still very active. So it's, it's fun to have Joe. I hope he's on the answer line today. We're celebrating 25 years. Last year was our 25th year, and uh, we had a memorial pin, and that was our big party that we rented a big hall and really enjoyed ourselves. Even uh, Natalie came down and gave an excellent speech to everybody. That's our 25th celebration. Here's our stats for our master gardeners. We've got about 250 members. Our project hours are up there. We, we do about a half a million dollars worth of value to, uh, to master gardeners. And, and the other thing is we're, we travel the most. We're the most traveled. Most of our, as you can see in the gray area there, most of our things are community outreach. So we've been really hampered this year by, um, by everything. So we're gonna have to really dig and, and do things and, and we're coming up. I'll show you some of the things. We have two classes per year, which is kind of unusual. We have, we've had a Monday night class and Tuesday morning class for all the times I've been here. And I think before we have five to seven mentors for each class session. We average about 50 students in both those classes. We can only, that old building only holds about 25 or 30 per class. So that's one reason. But over the 16 years I've been here, we've done 32 classes. Um, our master gardeners jumped right in. We finished several class. We finished the last five classes. We've jumped in and done what we call the third Saturday program. It's a gardening program. We hold our monthly meetings now. We do our budget meetings. We have a beginner newcomer class, and we've even started up a new video club recently. 32, 33 zooms. I think that's probably 35 now. Here's um, another, here's a category that I didn't mention. When we had uh, COVID camp come through and then the Easter tornado really devastated parts of Chattanooga, devastated it. So we decided to reach out and help. And those are the hours that, that Master Gardeners have, um, I think those are fairly up to date, but they really came through with lots of help. We just made it through the last three classes were conducted by Zoom with this class called the Beginner Newcomer class, basically started by Mike Payne uh, 25 years ago. And then when he married Stephanie, Stephanie's jumped right in and they've, they continued to do that class. They get about 40 to 50 students and uh, it's a very great class to uh, introduce people to uh, Chattanooga newcomers. But Hines is, has been teaching that class too. He's been president a few years. Um, in the past, helped help do our county fair, very active, and he's uh, called our compost guru. Here's the other thing that we miss out on, our garden expo. We hold it at this uh, arena every year, Camp Jordan. Master Gardeners basically set up a contract with the arena. We're not part of it. We are the whole thing. 2,000 attendees, 14 lectures, 60 vendors. It's quite a deal, and we really felt bad that we couldn't do it. Here's what basically it looks like when we get it all set up. And uh, it's a big, big thing in spring. And there's our vendor, vendor uh, layout and some of the designs some of our master gardeners do. And we started, we really pushed the hotline this year. We've, we've had a hotline for a long time, but we advertised it in the free press and started uh, really making it so that uh, master gardeners could answer questions in the community because people have been really um, more interested in gardening their home. So that's been a big plus this year. One of the things that kept on going is the zoo project. The zoo crew uh, keeps on going. They distance and mask and, and carry out their activities. So that's a pretty good thing. Here's the county fair. We, uh, last couple years, we've they liked us so much that we've taken on like a quarter acre site with 10 tents of our own. And then the middle has all kinds of activities for kids. We have a big answer tent and really, really do that up big. Last year, we really, we decided to do something special. So we made this, um, this um, soil tunnel. And so kids go through here, through this and they see these murals. They see insects dangling, snakes on the floor. They hear creepy uh, music. And we even air conditioned it last year um, because the fair was kind of hot. And so uh, one of our master gardeners um, found out a way to put some air in there. We, uh, we have this newsletter that, that went for an award 
but uh, didn't get it, but I think it will in the future because it's pretty unique. It's called the Friends Newsletter. This is, these are, it's done by Master Gardeners for Chattanooga or for the greater Chattanooga area. And it's a newsletter that has um, close to 2,000. I think we're pretty close to 2,000 people that um, hear all the activities going on. We continue to do our third Saturday classes by Zoom. We even did our um, expo by Zoom. We did three, three classes that, that day. So we're kind of in the middle of that process right now. And that's been very, very successful. We average about 60 people on that Zoom meeting. Um, Speakers Bureau is um, still continuing. This is 2019. It'll be interesting to see. I'm sure that the stats won't be quite as good for 2020, but, but it's been very, uh, very uh, active in the years past. So I think we're going pretty good. Here's, okay, here, the next few things are going to be videos. Hi there, it's Sally Ford from McCoy Farming Gardens. This is our first video in a new series of video updates of the gardens. We thought it would be nice to show you around the gardens once a month and spotlight a few plants each time. If all goes well, we plan to expand our video series to include some on McCoy history, the trails, bird walks, and more. I thought I'd start out and give some background on the gardens. These gardens are the result of a five-year labor of love by members of the Signal Mountain and Walden community and the Hamilton County Master Gardeners. It all began a year or so before I moved here back in 2012. The vision was to restore and expand the historic gardens with sustainable conservation practices and with pollinators in mind. Making these gardens happen took years of planning, clearing, and designing for the right eco-friendly soil and the right plant selections to attract monarchs and other pollinators. Most of the plants are native perennials. On a nice note, this last month we found out that the gardens won the project category in the Search for Excellence Award from the statewide Tennessee Extension of Master Gardeners. We were thrilled. It's wonderful for our community. You know, there are so many beautiful plants this time of year, and each bed is teeming with new growth, flowers, and activity. Let's head on to the gardens to get a look at the overall lay of the land, and then look at some of the specific plants that are quite lovely. See you there. Well, here we are at McCoy, starting at the fire pit and looking out over the apple orchard. It just couldn't be a prettier day. Breeze is blowing and air is cool under the trees here. The gardens are shaped like a horseshoe and still have some legacy plants like the Coosa dogwood and rhododendron. This bed here nearest the apple orchard has lots of spring ephemerals and other interesting species. And then over here at the base of the horseshoe, near the pavilion, is a bed that has all kinds of ferns and celadine poppies, trillium, columbine, and many others. And then the part of the horseshoe beyond that's nearest the house has all kinds of flowering shrub like oak leaf hydrangea and other varieties of hydrangeas, native azaleas, witch hazel, and we just added in some new varieties of clethora. We also have a new fringe tree planted here in memory of Doug Newton. It's very sweet. I hope, hope you'll come see it. Now I'm going to walk up towards the end of this bed near the apple orchard so you can just get a feel for the lush variety that's here. Most of the plants that we'll be looking at are native perennials that attract bees, hummingbirds, and butterflies and other pollinators. 
and most of them are deer resistant which is wonderful because you'll see some plants that have been chewed on. All right, I'll walk up to the front of the bed where we'll look at our first specimen. It's one of my favorites. You'll probably hear me say that a lot today because they're all so beautiful. All right, just around this corner. The first one we'll look at is called foam flower. Tiara cordifolia is its botanical name. Here we go. And it looks like little tiaras for Cinderella. These sweet woodland flowers bloom in early spring and stay, well here it is June, so they're still blooming, but they'll eventually go away and we'll have others blooming in its place. They always make me think of fairies dancing, light and airy, but they can be massed to form a ground cover. Really beautiful. Now let's come back around the corner. We have several back here. Next one we're going to look at is Columbine. Aguilegia canadensis is its botanical name. And we'll come back to the Aquilegia in just a minute. They're beautiful nodding wildflowers with red sepals and yellow petals and yellow stamens. They bloom from early April to June and like sun and part shade. While they appear delicate with fern-like leaves, they are tough and durable and they self-propagate. The botanical name Aquilegia comes from the Latin word for eagle because the five red sepals resemble an eagle's talon. Now our next one is a really important one for the butterflies. The fennel, Phenoliculum vulgare, beautiful feathery fronds and airy flowers that are favorite of the black swallowtail and monarch, both as food for the larva and nectar for the butterflies. You may remember that columbine and fennel are part of Ophelia's bouquet in Hamlet, she said as she walked in with the bouquet. There's rosemary, that's for remembrance. Pray you love, remember. And there's pansies, that's for thoughts. There's fennel for you and columbines. There's a whole language of flowers from the Victorian era. Maybe we'll explore that sometime sooner or later. Hopefully sooner. Now the next one we're going to look at are these pretty sun drops. Anathera fruticosa. These bright yellow flowers that bloom during the day, unlike their cousin, the evening primrose which blooms at dusk. They are upright growing on two feet, two foot stalks and have two inch yellow flowers with four petals. I don't know if you can see it, but there's an ant crawling around on that one. This is a great plant along a border and it's not uncommon to get one from a friend because they grow so well and transplant easily. Now our next one is Star of Persia, Allium Christophe. I'm going to focus in on that bloom there. It's a perennial with a globe of star-shaped silvery purple flowers that are native to Turkey, Iran, and Central Asia, hence the reference to Persia. They like the sun and make such an impact in the garden and can be dried for arrangements. And the the flower heads will fall off and remain on the ground and they still look lovely just laying on the ground. 
Now, here's another one of my favorites. They're all my favorites. Oh, and look. See the bee? These are foxglove. Penstemon digitalis are the white ones. And then back beyond are Penstemon calicosis. And they're lavender. These are native perennials with these lovely white and purple blooms on a smooth green stalk with deep green leaves. It blooms in early summer. Penstemon refers to the five stamen in the flower. And the interesting thing, for some reason, four are fertile and one is sterile. Maybe it's just the place where bees can hold on. Deadheading them to the ground in the fall along will allow the rosettes at the base to become a nice ground cover. Okay, now our next stop, Coreopsis, right here, right at this pretty little walkway, stone walkway. Another one of my favorites. Coreopsis auriculata, and they have a common name of mouse ear or tick seed Coreopsis. They grow in dense bushy clumps with deep green leaves and bloom from April to June. Coreopsis means like a little bug referring to the seeds. Each leaf has a pair of small lateral lobes that resemble the shape of a mouse ear. I'm going to see if I can find one. Here we go. See these two little leaves here, here, and here. Those are the mouse ears. So you have tick seed for the shape of the seeds and mouse ears. Coreopsis makes a beautiful ground cover. Now we're going to walk around to this bed at the base of the horseshoe near the pavilion. That pavilion has seen many wonderful things. Dances, meetings, reunions, meals, weddings. And here we have celadine or wood poppy, Styloforum diphyllum. These beautiful bright yellow flowers among lots of green leaves appear in late winter and bloom into late spring. An interesting thing is that the yellow sap of the stems has been used as a dye by Native Americans. I want to show you the white bristly seed pods because they're also beautiful. See there up underneath the leaves? These seeds from the seed pod along with short rhizomes spread the plant. And you can see it's done a great job in this bed. It's just full of celadine poppy. And our last spotlight of this video is the trillium. Three leaves. Trillium luteum is the yellow trillium. And I think that's what this is, but I can't be sure because the flower is gone. They're sometimes called toad shade with the idea that toads sit up underneath the leaf like that and wait for bugs to come. These are sessil trillium, which means that the flowers bloom without a stem as compared to white or red trillium, which have a stem for the flower. The fruit ripens around July and ants take the seeds back to their nest in the ground, helping to plant them for the next spring. Another example of an ephemeral well, that's our first video tour. We hope you enjoyed it. And it has inspired you to spend time with gardening. There's so much to learn and enjoy. We'll share more videos over the summer and early fall. See you soon. Okay, now we're gonna take you downtown to the Aquarium Butterfly Garden. Thank you very much to Sally for that. Um,
very good uh, presentation. This is our project that we started, gosh, probably 13, 14 years ago. And um, take it away, Mike. This is the aquarium in Hunberg and Butterfly Garden that's downtown. We're just off the Tennessee River here, back behind from where you are right now. It's opposite where the gardens are. The gardens were originally started as a project in 2006 to host the Southeast Regional Master Gardener Conference. So with that conference being here, we were trying to find an activity that would in, you know, get all the master gardeners involved. So we came up with the idea to build these gardens between the two aquariums that are downtown now. Or it, they had just finished the saltwater aquarium and the uh, freshwater had been here for about 10 years. So once we started the, in here, we've tried to find a piece of land. This was absolutely a terrible piece when we first started. And so I had to approach the, not only the people with the aquarium, but also the people with city parks and recreation to get their approval to put this garden in here. The garden itself was originally designed as 10,000 feet. And so the everybody with the city and the aquarium decided that, okay, let's try 2,500 feet. That's what we ended up building was about a 2,500 square foot garden here. And it is sort of taken a mind of its own. And it's one of the projects that's been the mainstay of the master gardeners here in Hamilton County in Chattanooga. It's itself are really one of the mainstays that we use as a training uh, volunteer, and it gives uh, the master gardeners a good chance to take and volunteer their hours here and also learn about the gardening itself uh, in the weeds that we have in behind here because it's constantly, that's really what we have to do is constant weeding, deadheading during the summer. And it actually attracts probably uh, somewhere between eight, 9,000 visitors per year just coming through and looking at the gardens. And if you volunteer here, you will have to ask questions. As the gardens itself, as it developed in, in it sort of matures, each year we have to look at how the garden is and make changes to it. Mother Nature has her own way of moving plants around, changing things. The city also has changed our garden because they, uh, where I'm standing right now was actually the sore spot because it's about a 30 foot deep hole. And so we had to work around this area and we built a retaining wall with it and then uh, one of our master gardeners is a, uh, is a good blacksmith, Jeff Jared, and he took and built this nice trellis to go along with it. When they built that on that, it actually acts as a cover for this bad area in here. So you can take a bad piece of ground, look at Im in improving it, and we added soil, we keep adding it to it each year. Now we have anywhere from six inches to almost a foot and a half of topsoil in here over a period of about 14 years. It, there's many different aspects of this garden. We started out with really trying to use as many natives as we can. But one of the things we found out we needed to fill in with some, uh, some a little bit of exotics and a lot of little annuals to sort of fill the dead spots. That allows the pollinators to come in here, which are down in the downtown area, to come in and do their little business in here, pollinate the plants. And we've also found we get uh, a few volunteers in here, which the, the, we will end up getting goldenrod and we get Queen Anne's Lace in here and they'll show up in here and uh, we don't mind having some of that. We have to pull some of the Queen Anne's Lace because it can get invasive. But as you can see back behind me, some of the perennials and this is a prime time of year right in the middle of June when uh, it really it's full blown bloom. It looks good. We get a lot of visitors to here, but we do have to have people come down here and deadhead so we keep the constant bloom and keep it looking good. Well, it, like I talked about before, we have a variety of plants and some plants do really, really well. We found, had to swap out some. This is black and blue salvia. This plant here is probably one of the mainstays of this garden. It started out with four little po uh, four inch pots about six years ago. And now we have this mass that's probably about 10 by 10 or 12 by 12. And it is one of the early bloomers in the garden and it will stay here till almost the time when we get frost. So this is one of the things you can put out in your yard and it will actually spread itself and it does very, very well here in the garden. Back behind me is, of course, you can see the trellis that was, we had installed. 
this trellis was put in here to originally we thought about putting a uh, passion vine in here we put it first year it did really really well during that year passion vine died off we found that passion vine likes to run where passion vine wants to go of course it's every place in the garden except for on the trellis so we did find that if we put the coral honeysuckle in here it not only stays here year after year it will come back and it's it's been real vigorous grows real well and the hummingbirds absolutely love this plant as it continues to bloom all summer long in this garden that we have down here we have a lot of passion vine the passion vine itself is really just a nice stable flower it's good nectar flower it's actually called a maypop and when we planted it in here we planted it on the trellis but mother nature has a place that she wants to put it but what's really good about the uh, passion flower or the maypop is that it is also a host plant for several uh, butterflies and so you'll get a gulf artillery that'll come in here or flittery as some people call it and it'll lay its eggs in the fall in here and it will actually devour this vine as it goes along so it's one of the real good mainstays of a nice uh, hummingbird butterfly garden if you're going to have one here we have one of the good uh, I don't know if I want to consider it one of the best plants I have as far as attracting bees and butterflies, but if you'll come down here during the day when the sun's out full, you'll see bumblebees, honeybees, just about any kind of bee or wasp actually on this plant. This is called hyssop. It's actually a herb, but it's one of the best plants I've seen. And what's really good, it will reseed and it will also come back. It is a perennial. Some places I've found it's sort of finicky, but once it finds a place it likes it, it generally looks like this. It's nice, healthy, and it'll stay this way from uh, about the end of June all the way till about the 1st of September. If you cut it back a little bit, you will get a little bitty smaller secondary blood that's a little As you can see, I've got in front of me, here is a, a big stand of fennel. Now, this is bronze fennel, and it absolutely loves it here. The one reason we planted it, it is another that is related to the dill family and swallowtails absolutely love it. They will lay their eggs, they will come over here and the larva will eat this until they actually pupate and then turn into the next butterfly. But what's really good is if you let it go to seed, they get little seeds on the ends of this. This becomes anise then, but this, if you want like it, the bulbs are used for dessert and in different dishes, but it also has that nice fresh licorice smell. So you can't go wrong planting this, just understand that uh, it has a pretty hardy taproot and you wanna dig it up, it's gonna take a little bit of backbone to do it. Here we have uh, one of the two original uh, butterfly bushes that we had, it's called Black Knight. This plant has been here as the oldest plant, one of the oldest plants in the garden. It's been here since 2006. So if you look at it, then you're 14 years being cut back several times. But the good part about this is that you cut it back before you cut off the dead the more it'll bloom. It will bloom all the way until just after frost and all the way until frost in the following fall. So if you want a good solid plant to put in the back, some people think it's a little invasive because it'll drop in the seeds and sometimes it'll spread. But you can actually pull it out, but it makes a good background plant it also is a great nectar plant for butterflies and the bees absolutely love it once they find where it is. Over here, throughout the garden, you'll see just little spots of annuals. Most of the garden that we have as annuals are the zinnias. We do have some dill, which is around the other side. It's just now getting up to the size that will start uh, attracting butterflies. But this one right here is really a good nectar plant for butterflies because they'll sit on the top with their little snap the hibiscus they'll sit here and they'll drink the nectar right out of each one of these and so the, the zinnias will fill in when some of the perennials sort of die back a little bit or get you know too much heat during the summer but they will if you as long as you keep cutting them and dead hit them they'll be here all summer for you. yeah in, in our garden this year we actually planted some dill because i wanted to attract a few more of the swa swallowtails and once this gets a little bit bigger, probably about towards the end of July, 1st of August, you'll start attracting uh, the swallowtails, eastern swallowtail. You might even find uh, some of the some of the Tennessee swallowtails that are in here, which will be a zebra. So they'll lay their eggs and it 
realistically, they will almost eat this completely to the ground, but don't worry about it during the summer. It will come back in the fall and you'll have a few more plants. Okay, as, as you can see, I'm standing in the middle of oak leaf hydrangeas and I've got large beauty berries, which are both native to this area. And they're, they're back and behind, they make a nice cover. And behind me, underneath this, is the structure that we intended to cover when we originally built this garden. We built a retaining wall around it because it's an 18 foot deep vault and it's 18 foot wide. And it basically feeds all the water to the outside of the aquarium. So when we planted this, we knew there was a structure that we had to go around. But as you can see, both shrubs have been very well, <laughs> they love it in here. They've been very well kept and they enjoy being in this area. Thanks, Mike. So now we're going to go down to the food bank, which just was it's just down the road a couple miles, and Katie Bishop is going to give us a tour of that. Sawyer. I'm a volunteer with the Chattanooga Food Bank uh, Community Garden. I used to be director of the food bank. I'm also a master gardener. And the history of the garden came about in the 80s when between a partnership with the food bank and the Chattanooga Housing Authority to develop some gardens in some of the housing sites. Eventually they petered out and the only one left was in the Golden Gateway which served all of the residents up in that area. That lasted until the uh, food bank moved to this location. And because there was some space for a garden, we immediately thought we have to have a garden here. So we began to develop that idea, got some grants. The master gardeners were very instrumental in getting it going. They gave money, they gave labor, and eventually in 2009, it opened. So it's been going ever since. This is the Chattanooga Area Food Bank Garden, formerly known as Evelyn Davenport Navarre Teaching Garden. It's also a certified Ten Tennessee Master Gardener demonstration garden. We have 23 raised beds here. The produce harvested here goes to the Chattanooga Area Food Bank, which is directly across the parking lot from the garden. The garden sits right behind the food bank. Out of these 23 raised beds, we produce roughly 1,000 to 1,500 pounds of food each year, and it goes to the emergency food box area. The pavilion and the greenhouse were built in 2010. The pavilion and greenhouse were help constructed by the, with the master gardeners, but with many organizations throughout the city. The raised beds were built by master gardeners and first put in in 2010. In conjunction with that, we have a butterfly garden. The master gardeners put in a shed and storage behind that. There are several rain barrels and a larger cistern to collect. The pavilion is used for organizations, uh, garden clubs, they hold meetings from the food bank and it's also used as a work area. The greenhouse is used to start most of the plants here in the garden but also to start community um, starts for the community gardens and school gardens. A rain garden was also built by the master gardener several years ago. A rain garden collects water from the parking lot and the roof. During a heavy rain, there's a lot of runoff. The idea is to collect it and let the earth filter it before it gets to the river, which is directly behind us. In this rain garden, we have a lot of natural plants as well as some annuals, such as the 
zinnias, which attract a lot of butterflies. We have a hummingbird butterfly garden at the food bank. We have several host plants, purple passion vine, milkweed, and Dutchman pipe. We have a hummingbird feeder, and these are just wildflowers and zinnias that come back every year. The zinnias are not a host plant, but they're a great butterfly attractor. A rain barrel is used to collect and store water. This one's attached to a shed. We have roughly 50 square feet, half of the shed connected to a gutter, connected to the rain barrel. In one inch of rain, this barrel will collect 30 gallons. It's a 55 gallon drum. It has an overflow. You need something underneath the overflow so it doesn't wash the soil. You need to put your spigot up high enough to have a bucket or your watering can underneath. You can use all kinds of containers for gardening. This little area has a recycled grocery bag with a flower in it. This is a habanero, which doesn't take up much room in a pot. It's designed for containers. This is a larger container and it has three little patio choice uh, tomatoes with it. They're really quick growing and also some fennel. This little container, which is another grocery bag, has a pole bean in it. Just make sure you have a big enough trellis. This one's gonna get really large. This is the rain barrel that we adapted. We just cut the top third off, left the ends to hold the shape of it. These are some large pots with rosemary. This is another one, same thing, that has beautiful little cucumbers coming on it. And the last bed down here is a stand-up bed. So it's a little higher and easier for older people. They don't have to kneel on the ground to work. There's many ways to use a trellis in your garden. This is a single bed that has a trellis on the north side. There's cherry tomatoes planted in it because cherry tomatoes can grow 12 feet and I can tie them off to the top of the trellis. These are just some cages with some cow peas in them. They get really large and hang over. This other bed has string tied up to the top of the trellis and the pole beans will run up the string and over the top of the trellis. This is table queen winter squash. Winter squash is grown in the summer. It's called winter squash because if you harvest it correctly, it will store up to six months through the winter. It's a large plant that will trail out over your bed, more of a vine than anything else. Squash, you have male and female blossoms. The male blossom is much skinnier at the base. The female is much wider, so it kind of has like little hips. Once this is, this does need to be pollinated, usually with bees, and this is the little tiny squash that forms. Thanks, Katie. Now we're going to go back to the Ag Center and we're going to talk about our adventure day camp, which we, this would be the fourth year of doing it, but um, of course we can't have all the kids at the Ag Center, so we decided to do something different. Everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Stebbins. I'm the county agent here in Hamilton County and I'm going to describe what we what we don't normally do but we're this what we're going to do this year with our kids camp and the kids camp won the, the Tennessee Search for Excellence Award this year for for kids activities and so um, and it's been going on this is the fourth year we'll, we usually have about 10 Master Gardener mentors we get about a dozen kids uh, the class goes from 9 o'clock in the morning to 2 in the afternoon. We give them snacks, we give them food. But this year we've got an array of, of items 
that we're going to, we think what we'll do is send them the, the bag of items. We call it a bucket of garden goodies. And uh, we're going to send all these things. We'll probably deliver them to their doorstep and it has instructions. But we'll describe, Katie and I will describe how this is going to work this year. Hello, my name is Katie Bishop. I'm a program assistant with Tom Stebbins. As he said, this is our fourth year at camp. It usually runs all week with a different topic every day. This year we will deliver everything in one package and the kids can take their topic as they go along. So one of the topics is trees. And in this packet, they will also get two, pa two magazines on trees and they'll get crayons and some extra paper to work on leaf rubbings. Another lesson is on water. And lots of information on water. And you'll also get a, a packet of chalk to do sidewalk art and draw your own river. Another lesson is on insects. The insects one you get a bug collecting kit and a hand lens. So you can capture some insects and then look at them with your lens. We have a large section on garden and flowers. The garden, we do have some information from our friends at 4-H. And the garden one, we took it four, four packets of seeds. They get a make a flower kit. And then a nice healthy eating challenge so you can eat out of your garden. And the last lesson is on soil and compost. You'll get a cubic foot of soil, a big bag of soil, and a bucket to grow whatever you want in it. I'll get a bucket. And this bucket is a grow bucket, has a little wicking pot and water flow reservoir in the bottom, a place to fill it, and an overflow hole. So you add the soil, assemble it, then add the soil, put the soil down in the pot and fill it up, and then you add the water here. You can tell you've watered enough because it'll come out the overflow hole. And you'll have plenty of soil to fill this pot. And the craft for the soil is a rock, and you get to paint the rock whatever way you want. You can have your name on it. You can make it a ladybug. Uh, you can have a pleasant idea like smile. Or you can put a friend's name on it and give it to your friend. There's also extra things in here. There's a roll of stickers, there's a bird and bloom magazine, there's a journal, there's a Fitbit, there's pencils, pens, erasers, little bug erasers, bug pencils, a water bottle, and a snack of crackers. And now we're going to hone in a little bit on how to make one of these earth buckets. And we had nice help from Evangeline James from Br Bridley County. She came down and filmed this um, one day, a couple, about a month ago. And uh, this will be done by Carlton Mathis. My name is Carlton Mathis. I'm with the Hampton County Master Gardeners here at the Food Bank and we're building grow buckets or earth buckets. Here's a finished product, you know, with the overflow hole for the reservoir, the field tube, and in these grow buckets you can grow tomatoes, peppers, bush type okra or bush type green beans or 
cilantro or, or some herbs like that. But this is how you make them. It has a false bottom and this is filled with soil. You fill the water here until the water comes out of the, growth, out of the drain hole. You can't overfill it, so that's when you know when to stop filling. And this is how it comes together. You have a five gallon bucket that you, that you can get from any big box store or you get, make sure you get the lid with it. So here's all the materials. You got a five gallon bucket, a field tube, and this field tube has to be cut so that when you fill it, it won't, it won't seal off. So the water will go in and fill up the reservoir. And this field tube is held in by, by, by a twist tie, and it's also held in by the, uh, by the way you cut your false bottom. So you have, your, you have the bucket with the lid, and here's the cutting diagram. So we have a, a four inch pot and you cut it so that the pot fits through the top of the lid. And then this shows a cutout for the field tube that you put through here. And then you put this on here and take a saber saw, take any saber saw and cut around, cut out your, the hole for the wicking, uh, wicking cut, cut out the hole for the field tube, and then finally cut out the edge for the, to make your false bottom. So, and what, what keeps it a false bottom is, this is the four inch drain tiles. You can use uh, tin cans or you can use extra uh, planting cups. But those go in the bottom that holds up the, the bottom, the, the false bottom. Put the field tube in. And this is our wicking cup. Then you fill it with soil. Now don't fill the soil to the top of the rim. Leave like a half inch or an inch of space on this bucket when you fill it with soil. So it's filled with soil, and then you plant your tomatoes, peppers, bush okra, or, or bush green beans, and you're done. This bucket should last several seasons. I've, I've been growing uh, bell peppers in it for at least five years, so good luck. Thank you, Carlton. I think what we're going to do now, there's just a couple of things coming soon. Our master gardeners have started this virtual garden tour, which is going to be another thing we can't do perfectly this year. We can't do our, our garden tour. So we're going to videotape a lot of gardens and then we're going to show those um, probably in Zoom meetings somewhere down the road. We've got some excellent gardens to show off. So um, I think Natalie is going to be down in front of our building with um with our awardees katie bishop won the award for um for the kids class kids gardening class and sally ford for projects for that mccoy pro property so um i think we'll keep it there and i think natalie's going to take it away from here um, so congratulations oh, to mccoy farm and garden uh, garden for being our project kind of our demonstration garden uh, type of search for excellence winner. Yes, and that was an excellent video. And I so, didn't mean we. There yeah. were so many of us who worked together on that business, pulled it off, and we love it. We are excited to share your videos and Thank see you. more as that project grows and continues. And um, oh, we have Tom out here now. And um, and so we are also excited to celebrate his stamp. Uh, which is one of our youth search for excellence award winners uh, this year. The yeah. yeah. And so I know we got lots of great comments about the way that you guys have kind of adapted and changed um, some of what you've been doing for kids camp this year. Yeah. So, so that's very exciting. Um, and the final thing, which is not on your schedule, Tom, because you didn't actually know this was going to be happening today is um, we have a special award for you. As you might have been watching on some of our other videos, for the first time this year, we're doing some special coordinator awards. Um, we've done experience, we've done early stage, and you are our urban coordinator of the year. Oh, You're our very oh, first one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And, and I don't think that any of us could explain any better than some of the projects that have been showcased today what um, somebody with knowledge and experience and a passion to work in urban areas can bring to yeah. our extension program. So, congratulations. Congratulations. It was a, 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 it Thank you everybody for joining in. Thanks Chattanooga for a great day. You're going to get videos all throughout the month of August and uh, we will keep in touch. Have a great rest of your weekend.